outside and it's a Saturday afternoon, but thanks for resisting and still being here. Uh, for our next panel, we have Professor Kathy Schneider from American University in DC. Uh, Professor Schneider holds a PhD from Cornell University. She teaches on comparative social movements, political violence, criminal justice, race, and race ethnicity, and religious minorities, crime and immigration policy in Europe, the United States, and Latin America. Her publications include Shantytown Protests in Pinochet's Chile and Police, Power and Riots, Urban Unrest in Paris and New York from 1960 to 2010, which is currently under review. Schneider also has written numerous articles, including one that is very closely related to this panel, which is Repression and State Violence, Debating the Arab Spring, which was published by the Swiss Political Science Review in 2011. Welcome, Professor Schneider. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Well, um, I hear that the panel I just missed had a very interesting argument going on about um, how we understand <laughs> the revolts in the Middle East and North Africa. So I think um, these papers are going to spark more discussion. And I'm pleased to introduce my um, the first speaker. Uh, we have we're going to start with two papers on Iran. Um, then a paper on Egypt, and then two papers on Palestine. Um, so the first of my speakers is going to be Anshul Jain, who is going to speak on pamphlets, cassettes, smartphones, civil society, political opposition, and multiple incarnations of new media in Iran. Hi, thanks everyone for having me. Thanks to the New School for organizing this event. Um, thanks to Professor Schneider for moderating. Um, thanks to all the other panelists for giving such interesting talks. Uh, this, what I was trying to do in this paper is take a longitudinal view, because uh, we're a lot of a lot of the literature out there is looking at individual moments recently, and I thought it might help to look historically. So I'm looking for some patterns about what did and didn't work in different revolts, and specifically in the context of civil society and what helps and hurts the ability of opposition movements to gain traction. And I have to give a disclaimer. I got a little carried away with artwork. I don't <laughs> speak, read, or write Farsi, and I have some weird program that can translate things for me. So that's the artwork. I don't know if it's correct. I apologize if it's not. So the main questions I'm trying to answer is, can we address? Uh, how have opposition groups used new media to advance their agenda in different eras of the revolt? So I'm looking in the 60s, the 70s, and presently. What are the relative advantages and disadvantages of different media forms uh, for helping dissenting activism? How does the current opposition movement fit into a broader transnational framework of civil society? And what are the prospects for the current opposition given the current environment of new media, civil society, and the political realities that they face on the ground in their own country. So civil society in Iran, uh, one of the things, one of the challenges in looking at a civil society outside of the Western world is there are very few formal models that fit non-Western societies. And so specifically, one thing that's important is in, in addition to formal modes of association, it's important to look at informal modes of association because many of the formal modes of association have been created by the authoritarian regime. So the informal modes are the ones that are going to be more honest and accurate about what actually represent people's associations with each other. Can we do this? So the first era I looked at was from roughly 1963 to 1971. The White Revolution was implemented in 1963. It's a set of economic and social reforms. I'm sure you all know a lot about this. Uh, but the most contentious issue by far was that of land reform. And land reform, it was, it was overly ambitious and it was not handled well. And the result of it is it united the clerical and merchant classes of the country. And the economic conditions created by the land reform drove a lot of people from the villages into cities to seek employment. There they became discontented. They began to uh, consort with their urban counterparts. And 
pamphlets and leaflets became popular tools of dissent. These are called ilamia in Farsi. These are usually single page leaflets. They could be critical, they, they could be a criticism of the Shah, a criticism of white revolution policies. They could be uh, lists of people who are alleged to have supported the Savak or have conspired with the CIA. Um, and what allowed their spread so quickly was urban office workers had access to photocopiers. So from the cities, these could be duplicated in mass, and rural migrants, many of whom commuted into the cities for their work, would then go home. So what ends up happening throughout the 1960s is you have people who are going into the city to work, they're, they're interacting with urban workers, they're learning new ideas, new ideas of dissent, and you have a bridging of the urban-rural divide of opposition to the regime. And this paralysis is evident through uh, what happened with their national radio and television. Given this opposition, what can you do? You can rip down the leaflets, you can try to discredit them. Well, how do you discredit them? They're not going to go up. The Savak is not going to go around putting up leaflets around Tehran. So what they do is they try to broadcast on TV and on the radio. And one of my main arguments is this is a brute force tool. To, this is a sledgehammer against an ant. The next wave of revolt was the Islamic Revolution. And cassette tapes were a new technology that had become affordable by the early 1970s. Uh, and typically what would happen is by this point, Khomeini is in exile. He would call and he would give a lecture. The lecture would be recorded over the phone line or over 20 or 30 phone lines. And then from there, someone, those people would make phone calls. And within a few hours, you have thousands and thousands of cassette tapes ready to distribute around the very next day. These would usually happen when it was in the afternoon in Paris and in the middle of the night in Iran. And by the next morning, you have thousands of tapes that hit the streets. Bazari merchants have them, you know, typically inside a music cassette box will be a lecture of his, and these become enormously popular. The spread was facilitated by people within telecommunications ministries, telephone exchanges, and at neighborhood exchanges, telephone service people. These people could open up secure lines for Khomeini to call in the middle of the night. The best evidence of the paralysis of this is through an incident of, over Rasta Kiz. In 1975, the Shah merged the two major political parties into one, one of which was his, the other of which was the only sort of legitimate opposition party, which is the National Front. He merged them into one, and in an effort to try to create a bond of national unity, he tried to use state media, and state media became an even bigger target. And the cassette tapes just uh, were full of extensive criticism of this move. And the regime found itself incredibly off balance. And this whole effort to form and create and solidify Rastak is collapsed within a year or two. Internet appears in Iran around 1995, and it grew very rapidly. Uh, in 2000, there were fewer than a million people with access. By 2010, you have about 23 million people. It's an almost one-third penetration rate. It's one of the higher rates in the Middle East. Um, so the plus side of internet media, as opposed to previous eras like the cassette tape or the pamphlets, they're more user-centered. They're easy to use. They're adaptable to many formats of expression. and relatively low entry costs, meaning the infrastructure necessary is not too much. However, the downside is they're easier to monitor, they can be infiltrated, they can be countered, because the government uses this technology themselves, and they can be restricted towards direct controls. By direct controls, that means physical surveillance, intimidation. Showcasing means you make an example out of a case that you see. You find someone who is who has been publishing information or writing things, and you, you, make, you elaborately use that incident to make it very public, and you encourage people to self-censor as a result of that. The other way is indirect controls, which are legal and administrative controls. 
Iran has a whole slew of press laws and amendments. These were originally developed in the 1980s about uh, curbing defamation against the government. And then they added a series of amendments, and now they've updated them to include online content. And there's also their bureaucratic organization, which is looks something like this. Their bureaucratic organization is a mess. If you look at the very bottom on the left, that's you. Look at how many agencies there are who can make decisions about what you can and can't look at. So it's sort of this funnel effect, and the user has the least outlets and options. So it's an incredibly, set, it's an incredibly diverse set of agencies, all of which operate under very vague laws that can be interpreted very loosely and applied very freely. This. So the most recent opposition has been with the green movement and social media was very prominent at the center of this. Obviously this began as a result of the disputed presidential election and there was an important lead up to it. This was, this had, there, were, there were debates, uh, there, were, there were advertising, it almost looked like a real campaign. And a lot of authors argue that the opposition was primed to turn out and this had, there was activism in advance of this. The question I get from a lot of people Okay, so uh, social media was prominent in this but the opposition was effectively silenced by these controls that exist and this is because of the, uh, the regime is now aware of this technology and they know how to use it and they have ways to monitor it. So overall, there is a transnational competitive space that's emerging, but it's a very complicated and who knows what the shape of this will be in the future. So just to like wrap up, I don't want to say conclusions. I don't ever like saying conclusions. But small media were historically one component of many embedded in broader organizational frameworks. They were diverse, they were formalized, and, most, and they were centralized and led by prominent personalities. Older media forms were harder to access, but they had greater asymmetry. It was harder for the government to combat the cassette tapes and the pamphlets than it has been for them to combat the internet. Part of that is that they control the infrastructure of routing, wiring, internet service providers, so forth. So this loss of strategic asymmetry is a big obstacle to the opposition movement, and this is made worse by a lack of centralized leadership. And it just, it just loosely makes me wonder, are there lessons in this for protest movements elsewhere? Thank you. Um, the second paper, uh, these pairs are very interesting because the pairs of papers are one pessimistic, one optimistic. <laughs> so I want to turn it over to the optimistic story about women in Iran. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have introduced her. Lara Zuzin. How do you spell it? Golisorki? Yeah. Is that correct? Sorry. Okay. Um, from Dahi Square to Azadi Square, women activists have swamped a recent uprising in the Middle East and gave the protests a female face. Drawn from many different paths and inspired by endless reasons, women activists have flooded the streets to voice their demands across the region. The diversity in demands and the prominence of the female face has been particularly remarkable in the Iranian post-election protests of 2009. To the women activists in Iran, however, this post-election protest was just another marker in the long-lasting struggle for equality. Women's movement have a profound past in Iran, and while we became quite acquainted with Neda Aga Sultan's incentives and motives to join the protest, we have yet to discover the story of the women that marched next to her. So my analysis aims to explore the characteristics of these women activists and examines the various methods and strategies used um, by the activists on the case studies of the One Million Signatures campaign and the Green Movement. And to begin such analysis, we can consider four main theoretical frameworks that allow us to understand women's activism in Iran. The state and gender theory, feminism, women's agency, and women's awakening. And while these are are all important to my discussion, I would like to highlight the latter as it combines a theoretical and a historical framework. The women's awakening, and as Hamid Dabashi pointed out yesterday, does not mean that women were asleep before. 
Uh, women's awakening can be broadly defined as a historical marker in women's activism that identifies characteristics of the women and methods and strategies used by the activists in a particular period of time. In Iran, one may mark the first women's awakening to the early 19th century until 1920s, where a hype of feminist journals marked this early women's awakening. And from this historical discussion of women's awakening, um, we come to the contemporary women's activism in Iran, which can broadly be marked as beginning in post-1979 Iran. And in this women's awakening, uh, can, this can essentially be characterized by two types of activists, opponents and proponents. And significant to my analysis is the understanding of opponent women activists, who can be further distinguished as rebels and reformists. The main characteristic of reformist activists is their dedication towards women's rights. Reformists activate the, advocate the rule of law, gender equality, and legal representation, while the reformist activists are known for their continuous efforts in support of women's rights. Rebels are a young generation of women protesters and activists that are sometimes silent and sometimes not. And this indecisive activism is largely grounded on the variety um, of social and political issues and circumstances this young, this young generation has faced since birth, the latter which presents a further key characteristic of the rebels, namely age. Rebels are born immediately af before or after the revolution, so unlike their mothers, they did not experience mass demonstrations or revolutionary upheavals and unveiling. The environment shaping the rebels' aspirations and concerns is marked by its gender-segregated, veiled, legally, socially, and culturally restricted and discriminatory characteristics. And this brief introduction of the four frameworks that ground my analysis, particularly the latter, on women's awakening, lead me to my main discussion of this paper, the profiling of women's activists in contemporary Iran, and the examination of the methods and strategies used by the One Million Signatures Campaign and the Green Movement. Before I begin a detailed discussion on these two cases, however, it is important to note several elements that generally define the women's movement in Iran. And here I would like to draw um, from a quote uh, of two notable Iranian scholars, namely Homa Hudfar and Fatima Sadegi. They state, the women's movement in Iran does not fit into a classical model of a centralized and coordinated organization with clear leaders. Neither does it subscribe to any grand theories. However, its diverse organizations have demands that are shared across class, ethnicity, and generation, and even across ideological and secular uh, religious boundaries. So several fundamental elements of the contemporary women's movement in Iran can be drawn from this statement. Firstly, the movement is decentralized. It has branched out in very smaller activist groups. Secondly, the women's movement does not follow a grand scheme, a theory. It is, does not strictly commit it to any particular ideology. Thirdly, the women's movement is diverse, as it comprises women across class, ethnicity, and generation, just to name a few. And lastly, this decentralized and diverse um, movement is tied together by its common demands, which have been defined in various ways. I define it in my, in my paper very abstractly as change. Uh, so these four elements are very well reflected in the scope and methods of the One Million Signatures campaign and the Green Movement. So let's start um, with the One Million signature, Signatures campaign. Uh, the campaign essentially aims to address issues that women in contemporary Iran face and scopes to bring gender equality in the forefront of the political debate and the legislature by collecting one million signatures in support of Iranian law reform. And the campaign has identified two laws that it aims to reform, the polygamy and the adultery law. The methods and strategies used by the one million signatures campaign are multifaceted. Firstly, the idea of forming a non-governmental organization as presented in the campaign itself presents a novel form of women's activism. Secondly, the campaign uses two rather personal methods to aim for law reform that can be referred to as face-to-face -face approach, namely educational activities that imply direct dialogue with ordinary citizens in collecting signatures and a scope to reach the wider um, population and lobbying that involves direct dialogue between community leaders, academics, intellectuals, as well as policymakers. And besides these three impersonal strategies of activism, there are three uh, further strategies that have been used. Namely, the We Change 
um, website, which serves as a platform for activists not only to discuss current issues regarding women's struggle, but ultimately as a platform for women to share their ideas, to plan for mobilization, and to virtually gather women activists across the country. And beyond the website, the One Million Signatures campaign has also published numerous books intended to provide legal, legal training and lectures for the activists. And lastly, the campaign engages in various arts performances, including street plays, aiming to raise awareness um, of the public towards their demands. And the latter is essentially a method of activism that has become very prominent globally. Having outlined the various methods uh, used by the One Million Signatures campaign, we may now look at the profile of the activists and find reformists and rebels at the heart of the campaign. Interestingly enough, in her book, notable, notable figure of the campaign, Hora Zani, describes the rebels as fifth generation feminists, a description that reminds us of the earlier discussed theoretical framework of feminism and women's awakening. Briefly defined, these fifth generation feminists distance themselves from struggle over political and religious authority and base their activities on the practical demands rather than on identity and ideology. Thus, one may generally characterize this fifth generation feminist as non-ideological, issue-oriented women's activists. And besides the fifth generation act feminists that act as catalysts of the campaign, prominent figures such as Shirin Ebadi, Merangis Kaur, and Zara Ranabat compose a quite different um, generation of female activists, the latter which can be described as reformists. So as demonstrated in this exploration of the One Million Signatures campaign, we see the four earlier defined elements of women's uh, movement in Iran at heart. They are also very well reflected in the Green Movement. Most notably, the idea of a decentralized organization that brought together civil society leaders political and political activists. And to best understand this or organizational method of the post-election protest, one may look at uh, Musavi's slogan, Musavi, the oppositional leader, um, for each citizen, one camp. And the, be the idea behind characterizing the protest as one camp for all citizens underscores the idea that all Iranians, regardless of class, ethnicity, religion, or background, should, ha should have a camp, in essence, a loosely organized political or interest group to which, uh, towards which they can feel a sense of belonging. And the key element that was holding this diverse range of elements uh, of activists together was the idea of the common motive, which at first was to turn Ahmadinejad out of office, and later this aim was joined by deep fears about the country's future. And the motive of fear presented a particular motive for women to swamp the streets next to their brothers, uncles, and father. And this motive is very well reflected in the four profiles of women's activists I would like to present to you to conclude my uh, presentation. So firstly, let's look at Zara Ranavad, wife of oppositional leader Musavi. Ranavad was declared the Iranian Michelle Obama by the local press. Known for her colorful pulled back scarf and heavy makeup, Ranavad is a mother of three. She holds a PhD in political science and she has been become accredited for having turned Azara University into a center for women's scientific research. And this multifaceted personage of Ranavad embodies the women activists many aspire to be young or old. Secondly, and this populism of Ranavad has does not only helped the Green Movement, but also the One Million Signatures campaign to draw new members to the movement. Secondly, let's look at Neda, who many of us are fairly acquainted with. Three characteristics of the typical current women's activists can be found in the personage of Neda. Firstly, she was young, and this demographic feature not only complements the overwhelming participation of young women in the protest, yet it also reflects on the shifting demographics in Iran as a whole. This awakening of young Iranians is mostly prompted by the rather gloomy future envisioned under the current regime, including rising unemployment, social repression, and humiliation. These devastating trends that particularly affect young women and gives them more and more reason to join the movement and fight in the forefront of the protest. The last statement essentially denotes the second representative characteristic of the activists, namely gender. In contrasting, as I mentioned before, to the global surprise of seeing women in green, star, in, in green scars marching at the front lines of the demonstrations, the massive participation of women in the latest protests is not an unprecedented overnight development. 
Lastly, Neda did not belong to a political party of ideolo or ideological group. She thus um, fits into the category, it fits into the component of non-ideological, um, of the non-ideological women's movement. And even though I have two more uh, portraits, I will finish here um, with the idea that um, these, these, um, this profiling of these two women essentially comprises a snapshot of the diverse bunch of Iranian women's activists. And this is a sign for many that women play a key role in shaping Iran's future. And here I would like to conclude my presentation with a quote from Shirin Ivadi, notable women's activist and Nobel Peace Prize winner. She states, Iran is, like thunder, I, Iran is like fire under the ashes which could flare up at any time. And this is particularly true with regards to women's activism. It never stopped burning and it certainly flared up in the post-election protests of 2009. The worst job of the moderator is interrupting people, but I'm hoping that you get questions afterwards where you can, um, in fact, include some, of, some more of your work. And I would like to um, continue so that we do have a lot of time for questions and answers. So let me introduce Stephanie Dart Taylor, who is going to be speaking on the Egyptian movement and um, its relationship to past Egyptian movements. Thank you. Um, I want to thank our discussant for joining us, traveling from DC, um, and my fellow organizers for having me on the panel. Um, so I'll jump in. Just over a year ago, millions of Egyptians singing the Arabic anthem, My Homeland, and chanting Egypt, provided the soundtrack for the wild hope that became a reality. The ouster by the Egyptian people of Hosni Mubarak, president of the despotic military regime which had exploited, detained, and tortured them for decades. During lulls between pitched battles with police and military units, demonstrators tagged the streets and alleys around the revolutionary nucleus of Tahrir Square with hastily scrawled graffiti, some of which later became intricate murals, urging their fellows to continue the fight for freedom, for justice, but most tellingly for Egypt. These messages of patriotism, national solidarity, and gritty resolve were delivered through text, tags relaying sentiments like fight for Egypt, as well as more viscerally using traditional protest imagery but also the red, white, black, and gold of the Egyptian flag. As the events of late January and early February 2011 reverberated through the conversations and Im imaginations of observers the world over, it became difficult not to discern a distinct nationalism having arisen in Egypt, if not the greater Arab Middle East. We can juxtapose this nationalism against a complex regional historical precedent. In 1952, Gamal Abdel Nasser infused his pan-Arab philosophy with a more traditional European-style nationalism that gained traction in the region beginning in the early 20th century. Nasser's political project flowered with his free officer's coup, which ended the decades-long <coughs> rule of the Turkic monarchy and cemented his vision as the most dominant political ideology in Egypt during the 20th century, representing, in theory, a, a forward-looking, progressive, and zealously patriotic approach to foreign and domestic policy. But Nasser's vision was not bounded by the Egyptian border. His nationalism was pan-Arab, an ethno-linguistic solidarity against the phys physical and increasingly more insidious economic neo-colonial encroachments of the West. Nasserism congealed with the formation of the pan-Arab coalition of armies to challenge Israel, viewed by most as the representation of Western interests in the region, and was subsequently discredited by the coalition's pan-Arab defeat by Israel in 1967. Similarly, the 2011 revolts in Egypt did not happen in isolation. They were preceded by Ben Ali's abdication by popular demand in Tunisia, and followed by mass demonstrations in Libya, Palestine, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, and Iraq, as well as the displacement of leaders in Libya and Yemen. Protest tactics, strategies, and imagery have been largely similar throughout the upheavals of the region, both building on as well as transcending the traditional limits of national spheres. I argue that to an important extent, Nasser and the success of his unique project set the stage for the still developing nationalistic tendencies of the Egyptian and other uprisings beginning in the spring of 2011. I will discuss the major tenets of the Egyptian and pan-Arab nationalism that Nasser espoused and helped put into practice in the 1950s. Next I turn to the new nationalism still emerging from the wreckage of the eras of Nasser's successors Anwar al-Sadat and Hosni Mubarak including a brief analysis of the symbology and signage of the political parties that have formed since Mubarak's ouster. 
The various Egyptian nationalist organizations that Nasser was party to as a youth imbued him with a fierce Egyptian nationalism. This love of country is echoed in his own writing. In his autobiography, Hume Propaganda Pamphlet, he describes a 1944 battle during the British Zionist conflict. Quote, we were fighting in Palestine, but our dreams were in Egypt. Our bullets were aimed at the enemy, but our hearts were hovering round our distant mother country, which was then a prey to the wolves that ravaged it, end quote. He also incorporated secularism into his ideology in line with the tradi tradition of European nationalism and to distinguish his movement from the growing Muslim Brotherhood Party. Although Nasser kept the Egyptian nationalist cause closest to his heart throughout the rest of his life, Gradually, there developed in his rhetoric a commitment to the extra-Egyptian Arab nationalist cause, and along with it, more pronounced anti-Western sentiments, as Western incursion in the region presented roadblocks to Arab national autonomy. Integral to both Egyptian and pan-Arab nationalisms was the rejection of colonial and imperial intrusions, territorial or otherwise. The so dubbed setback of 1967, resulting from years of Nasser's searing anti-Israel tirades, was much more serious than this designation implies. It effectively ended Nasser's career and indeed his life, in addition to any serious hope that a pan-Arab consciousness might result in a con concrete outcome in the form of a state. The inclusive idea of one Egyptian nation has been the most defining aspect of the recent uprisings. Reflecting Nasser's emphasis on the three circles, Arab, African, and Islamic, which as he wrote, link us and which make our territory one, the Egyptian revolts are the best example of Benoit Chalant's claim that, quote, nation has been placed at the heart of all these protests. Sectarian, religious, or class divisions have been transcended into a call for national unity, regardless of individual demands or goals. Egyptians, of course, directed their revolutionary energy towards the state, but also towards one another. This is conspicuously visible on the walls of the city itself. Um, if you could please begin. Uh, so here we see, um, it's, it's okay, it's a graffiti that reads, um, Egyptian citizen, Muslim, and Christian, and you can see the Arabic letter Mim, the red letter, um, has been drawn to be the first letter of each word, uh, uniting the concepts conceptually, um, as well as visually. Um, and then if you can move on to the next one, and this is a symbol of the cross. Can you pull it out from the bottom there, so it's a, a little larger? Um, just, just it, make the, the window bigger, right? Or go to the bottom and pull it. No. Oh well. Yes, there. Yeah. Perfect. So this is the cross inside the crescent, um, uh, uniting the two religions of the of the nation, the state, I should say. Um, the mo the two most prominent themes in the extensive catalog of graffiti images I've collected, the Egyptian flag and symbols of ancient Egyptian civilization, represent a nationalistic tendency in the Egyptian theater of the Arab revolts. Uh, even those tags and paintings that, viewed in isolation, would be rather benign, such as a, a man screaming um, or a peace sign, um, become nationalistic when the colors of the flag are used in their depiction. In the more formalized political sphere, since the ouster of Mubarak, organizers of all persuasions forging new political parties have leaned heavily on these themes in their imagery, perhaps in an attempt to lend legitimacy to their programs. Um, even the logos of Islamist parties, like this one, uh, that do include the green of Islam, also sometimes subtly include the red, black, white, and gold of the Egyptian flag. Images and symbols of ancient Egypt are also prevalent in recent street art and political imagery. The majesty of ancient Egyptian civilization has been a political reference for centuries and was an especially important crutch for Nasser, Nasser in his mission to reinvigorate collective national pride. In the images that have surfaced in the past year, the pyramids of Giza have been a prevalent motif, um, as, have the, as have figures representing ancient Egyptian pharaohs and queens. The most evocative of these images and logos seek to combine ancient and modern symbolic imagery. In the more traditional political sphere, the logo of the Islamist Egypt Revolution Party features the Great Pyramid at Giza, overlaid with the colors and design of the modern Egyptian flag, combining the two most symbolically rich reference in contemporary Egyptian politics in classical nationalist fashion. Certainly crucial differences between Nasser's pan-Arab movement and the revolts of 2011 exist. For all his rhetoric about populism, the myriad photo ops of a grinning Nasser ceding land rights to grateful peasants, and, and his strident Nehru-esque speeches touting non-alignment, Nasser turned out to be a paranoid autocrat par excellence, prone even to talking about himself in the third person. 
As many charismatic leaders are, he was a man fraught with contradiction. Most detrimental to his country was the general fact that in spite of all his assurances that his regime re represented the oppressed masses of Egypt, this was not in fact the case. I'm quoting Bassam TV there. While it is of course still too early to determine whether the government that results from the 2011 revolts were, will turn out to be representative and egalitarian, the difference in foundational moments is crucial. Nasser's presidency was founded on a revolution of the few, while this new era was ushered in by millions of Egyptians on the streets, risking their lives for representative government, respect from their leaders, and dignity, a unity welling up from below. Uh, it is probable that Nasser's pan-Arabism had an impact on both the massive mobilization of Egyptians uh, and perhaps even Arabs throughout the region, as well as the exploitative and exclusionary regime paradigm that the people rose against. Uh, finish. Okay. Um, okay. This is due to the contradictory na uh, nature of Nasser's own persona and politics. In inspiring Egyptian pride and cohesion, Nasser may have laid the groundwork for the political potential that allowed for the collectivism and unification realized by Egyptians in spring 2011. Perhaps the widespread collective and actively expressed approval for Nasser, dormant or suppressed in the Egyptian political imagination for decades, reshaped the possibilities for widespread collective and actively expressed disapproval for Mubarak. And one more paragraph. However, it is impossible to deny that Nasser and his government set the stage for the exploitative and exclusionary regimes of his successors. Nasser's government was a tight-knit group of officers who cut their teeth together in officer training college, the war in Palestine, and in carrying out political assassinations. He had no qualms with the torture and decades-long imprisonment of anyone outside this circle, often without charge. This set a grisly precedent for the, his success that his successors fulfilled with aplomb. Uh, I, guess, I mean, I, I have a lot more, but I'll finish there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, now we move to Palestine, and uh, we're starting with uh, William Cotter's paper on uh, the silence in the wake of the Arab Spring. Um, during these revolts, there has been silence in Palestine. Relative silence. Um, I had the chance to be in the West Bank through the beginning of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolts, and I kind of found myself wondering with all of my international cohorts whether or not we were going to start seeing this there. However, it became pretty obvious to all of us that the situation in the occupied territories was vastly different than Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, or Syria. So what I tried to do in the paper is kind of look at some of the factors that might be contributing to the relative silence. It hasn't been completely quiet, but compared to some of the other countries in the region, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on that might be keeping Palestinians out of the street as opposed to you know the other situations in the region. So I kind of tried to argue in the paper that the continuing split between Hamas and Fatah, uh, coupled with a lack of other viable political options and kind of the historical legacy and the reality of modern life in the occupied territories is contributing to a situation where people are continuing to accept Palestinian authority and Hamas rule, as well as kind of a lack of a unified or sustained voice for social change in the territories. So first, the, the first thing that I kind of want to look at is the legacy of prior Palestinian social movements that have or advocated large-scale change. Social and political activism and grassroots organization has a very long history in Palestine. And it's kind of advocated at different points, both nonviolence as well as armed resistance. But the, kind of the legacies of two really important examples that kind of codify the two different canons of resistance I think are really worth uh, analyzing because I think they lend themselves to the current situation. And, and contribute to different, uh, you know, different opinions about what's happening now. Um, starting in 1987, the first Intifada began in an effort to throw off the occupation and kind of liberate Palestinians from life in the territories. On the whole, the first Intifada was characterized by mass mobilization, you know, large-scale walkouts, mass demonstrations, strikes, and generally it adhered to nonviolent principles. You could cite instances of violence throughout the first Intifada, but on the whole, it was mainly focused around nonviolence. The nonviolent protests were met with extreme levels of violence from the Israeli military. And I kind of argue that that response dictated the shift towards violence in the second intifada, where again, you know, more people were going out into the streets and they were using different resistance tactics and they were meeting kind of the same, they were meeting the same general uh, end from the Israeli military when they were out in the street. 
And um, after two failed attempts at ending the occupation through both nonviolence and violence, the historical legacy of state-sponsored violence is in some ways um, kind of maybe keeping Palestinians reluctant to take to the street again in mass because both of their major previous attempts have been met with harsh reprise. So this historical legacy, even though it's dealing specifically with the Israeli occupation, I think lends itself very well to discussing why Palestinians might be unwilling to demonstrate against either the Palestinian Authority or Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Even though neither of those organizations <coughs> carried out the mass use of violence against their citizens during the Intifada, Palestinians know that any attempt to throw off Palestinian leadership would undoubtedly be met with violent reprise, whether it's from the Israeli military or their own leaders. I think this is particularly true for the case of demonstration against the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, which is backed by all of the major Western governments, and Mahmoud Abbas is considered the leg legitimate leader of the Palestinian people, both internationally and in the PLO. So any attempt to remove the Palestinian Authority would be certainly be kind of seen as a move towards violence or a move away from democracy. So the authority would not hesitate to detain, arrest, or torture its own people in the event of a popular uprising. Kind of as evidence of this point, I cited an Amnesty International report, their annual report from last year, where they cited over 1,400 cases of arbitrary arrest or detention in the West Bank, as well as an additional 300 in the Gaza Strip. I, these examples kind of highlight the willingness of the Palestinian Authority and Hamas to arbitrarily arrest their own citizens and provide a glimpse into the tactics that they could be employing by, you know, could be employed by either group in the wake of a social movement that was calling for Palestinian political change. Additionally, the high level of security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli military in the West Bank, I think, could come into play uh, in the event of some demonstration against the Palestinian Authority. Any attempt to remove the PA could be a potential kind of pretense for a subsequent Israeli invasion to, its, to restore order. There's a high level of security coordination between the PA and the Israeli military, and that Israeli military also has overarching security control in the West Bank, and it kind of lends itself to the idea that in the event of a popular uprising, Israel at least could respond militarily if they wanted to, even if the demonstrators were calling for a change within the Palestinian political system of governance. And you can say the same thing about Hamas and the Gaza Strip. They haven't hesitated to use heavy-handed and violent tactics to re repress Palestinians. The first example that I cited was the forced expulsion of Fatah supporters in 2007, which effectively solidified their rule after elections. And then more recently, during the Egyptian uprising against the Mubarak regime, Palestinians demonstrating in the Gaza Strip in solidarity with Egyptians were met with beatings and interrogations from Hamas officers you know, in regards to their, their roles in the demonstrations. And you can apply that exact same example to the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority officers were trying to stifle popular demonstrations in solidarity with Egypt and Tunisia. And I think these kind of two specific examples offer a window into the potential response from Hamas and the Palestinian Authority in the event of a demonstration that could call for the end of their rule. I think, again, this kind of historical legacy of failed uprising against an occupying military authority also alludes to another important factor that can be seen as kind of detrimental for the prospect of social change. Although Hamas and Fatah have support bases in both territories, mainly in the major population centers, they're, they're suffering from a, from a lack of popular support, and a lot of Palestinians don't necessarily support either of the parties, but it's kind of unclear as to which, which path of change one should follow. You can ask the question as to whether the overarching goal of ending the Israeli occupation should be followed, or if you should focus on you know, making change within the Palestinian political system. And kind of despite the like, recent overtures of reconciliation in the wake of the Arab Spring, the path towards ending the Israeli occupation still seems to be favored, at least on an official level. I think this is evidenced by the recent political maneuvering in September in the United Nations by the Palestinian Authority trying to secure membership and statehood, as well as a prisoner swap between Hamas and the Israeli government that secured the release of Gilad Shalit. All of this came at a time that put the focus back on the external political situation and drew, drew the eyes of the world away from the internal Palestinian political problems that, if they were highlighted, could push Pal Palestinians more towards social change. Um, so kind of following this initial push by the Palestinian politicians towards Hamas, Hamas and Fatah reconciliation, which did happen in the wake of the Arab Spring, much of the debate and uh, negotiation regarding the new Palestinian Union government appears to have ground to a halt and come to a deadlock. The two groups are still disagreeing. Am I on time? No, you're okay. Fine. You're fine. Uh, the two groups are still disagreeing over the uh, leadership of the new government as well as what form it's going to take. And I, even most recently, uh, April 1st of this year, El Arabiya reported that uh, Hamas arrested over 100 Fatah members in the Gaza Strip for propagating rumors about the uh, worsening electricity crisis. And the electricity crisis is another thing that's becoming a sticking point in the reconciliation. And the reconciliation agreement is coming to a halt because for most of the day there isn't power in the Gaza Strip. Um, 
So this idea of political unification between these two, divided, two, two divided groups is pointing to another issue that I think has to be addressed when discussing why we haven't seen major pushes for social change in the Palestinian territories you know, post the start of the Arab Spring. Um, in the event of a grassroots social movement to, re to remove the current leadership bases, there's no clear successor to, to the current power structure, to Mas Mahmoud Abbas or Khalid Mishal, Ismail Hanina. Um, we don't see the same level of kind of popular disdain that you saw from Mubarak or Gaddafi under, under their rule. Uh, even though you know, their popular support bases are eroding, it's just not at the point yet where you see that kind of that level of disdain. But I think that the, the recent Palestinian Authority push for UN statehood kind of illuminated a potential fear by Palestinian leadership that if they would have kind of capitulated to Western demands in the United Nations and stood down and done what the West wanted, that it could have pushed more people in the Palestinian territories into the streets or at least really opened their eyes to the current situation. Um, oh man, fine. Good. Okay. I wanna, I'll just finish by talking about something that I thought was really interesting. Um, you're oh. out of time. Oh, I'm out of time. <laughs> Even better. Um, well, all the instances that I talked about, you know, there could be more. We could have this discussion for hours. But all of them together kind of paint a picture of a society that's not only fractured and divided by the effects of, of forced displacement and occupation, but I think one that, well, is, is barely divided on internal lines. And to really see a kind of change, we have to start focusing more on the, on the internal aspects of the situation there and less on the external political situation. Okay, the last paper is a more optimistic take on the Palestinian situation. And let me turn it over to Olivia Stransky. The stage is my gun. Thanks. Um, this article uh, comes from my boss, I will start with this. Uh, originally appeared in Samsung UA Magazine on January 7th. Uh, we're an online magazine that provides a space for exiled and persecuted writers, journalists, and poets to freely express themselves. Um, I covered that. <laughs> um, and this article has gotten me one accusation of being a Zionist and one accusation of being anti-Zionist. So, so far I'm par for the course. Um, <laughs> on stage, Freddie Mercury's I Want to Break Free blasts as the Mad Hatter leaps onto a table. Clad in tights and red leather, this curious Mad Hatter pulls Alice up for a decidedly un-Disney tango. Later, the caterpillar dangles upside down from a silk scarf as he tells Alice that she must save Wonderland by marrying a man her father has chosen. The Red Queen screams and sings, the stage revolves, and the captivated audience watches. After the curtain drops, the director, Giuliano Mercamis, walks on stage to tumultuous applause, surrounded by the actors he has trained, supported, and loved. This risque, polished production ran in January 2011 in a refugee camp in occupied Palestine called Janin that only a few years earlier had been the site of a battle that killed more than 50 Palestinians and left 4,000 homeless. A few months later, Giuliano and his last year students met in the Freedom Theater's acting school. The time had come for the students to begin working on their final production, uh, Spring Awakening. Uh, while theater may seem like an entertaining distraction from day-to-day -day confusion, Giuliano said his motivation to create the theater was to provide the opportunity for Palestinians, quote, to develop the skills, self-knowledge, and confidence which can empower them to challenge present realities and to take control of their futures. However, the production of Spring Awakening that Giuliano and his students had planned was never completed. On April 4, 2011, while leaving the theater with his one-year-old son in his arms, Giuliano was shot five times by a masked gunman. He was pronounced dead upon arrival at Janine Hospital. Henry Reese, co-founder of Samsonia Way and City of Asylum, Pittsburgh, met Giuliano through a Ford Foundation Space for Change conference. On Giuliano's death, Henry said, quote, the risk was palpable in the work Giuliano was doing. He brought together young men and women, angering fundamentalist extremists who firebombed his theater. In a context of violent politics, to use theater as a means of liberation and understanding, both as an acting technique and in his choice of plays. The images and reports from Palestine that reached the United States testify that Palestine lacks water, medical assistance, schools, and economic opportunity. However, one effect of Israeli occupation that is neither vi visible in photographs nor mentioned in brief news reports is the cultural occupation and oppression of Palestine. Uh, the troubled hi history of the Freedom Theater exemplifies this oppression. In 1987, Giuliano's mother created the Stone Theater, a place for children to take part in drama therapy. In 2002, the Stone Theater was bulldozed by the Israeli army. The Freedom Theater was built in 2006 to take the place of the Stone Theater, and since Giuliano's death, the building has been raided three times by Israeli military forces. 
Most recently, on December 29th, Zakaria Zubaydi, co-founder of the theater, had his amnesty revoked by Israeli authorities and was incarcerated. The reason for the Israeli government's animosity towards such a venue can probably be attributed in part to the call by some Palestinians, including Giuliano, for a cultural resistance to physical and political oppression in all its forms. For Giuliano, the theater was a substitute for violence, both personally and for his students. In the 1970s, he did serve as a paratrooper for the Israeli army. However, in 78, while stationed in Janine, he was ordered to pull orderly, an elderly man out of a car. He refused to touch the man despite the orders of his commander and was arrested and discharged. After this, Giuliano turned to acting and appeared in several major Israeli films, including Salt of the Sea, which was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. This was the end of his support for Israeli occupation, and for a long time he worked solely as an actor. However, at some point, art became a means to an end for Giuliano, as he expressed in 2006, quote, Art, in our case, can combine, generate, and mobilize other aspects of resistance. All I care about is resistance. I'm not doing art for the sake of art. I think art can generate and motivate and combine and create a universal liberated discourse. This is my concern. Juliana was the child of Arnemer, an Israeli communist and child advocate, and Saliba Kamis, an Arab Christian and secretary of the Israeli Community Communist Party. While giving birth to her son, Arnemer almost died when Israeli doctors refused to treat her for being married to an Arab. Despite his cross-cultural heritage, Giuliano initially only <coughs> went by his Jewish mother's surname. However, he ultimately took on both surnames, a literal indication of his statement that he was, quote, 100% Jewish and 100% Palestinian. Although he was introduced to Palestinian theater through his mother, his own work was quite different. While his mother focused on therapeutic exercises for children during the first intifada, Giuliano founded a theater that was, quote, the only professional venue for theater and multimedia in the north of the West Bank of occupied Palestine. In 2008, the theater opened its acting school, a uh, three-year professional program for young adults. Um, quote, to lead his organization took courage unimaginable to the rest of us. Making a community was, in this context, a very political act, says Henry Reese. He advocated cross-national positions without sacrificing his own point of view and was an anathema to extremists, an Arab to Israelis and an Israeli to Arabs. Uh, aside from the raising and firebombing, he faced opposition from Palestinians as well, especially from conservative elements who criticized his co-ed classes and liberal politics. Uh, the theater's production of Animal Farm pointedly challenged traditional religious authority when its adapted script featured Hebrew-speaking pigs. Um, with enemies in Palestine as well as Israel, there was still no certainty regarding who killed Juliana Merkamis and why. In October, I was given the opportunity to interview four of his former students, all of, been, had with, all of whom had been with him on the morning of his death. They had come to the U.S., uh, actually to New York City, to perform an adaptation of Waiting for Godot entitled While Waiting. After Giuliano's death, Udi Aloni stepped in to direct the third year production. Through help from Friends of the Freedom Theater, some of the students, now graduated, had been able to take the production out of Palestine and share the theater's work with the world. Um, originally, I came to the interview wanting to get a sense of who Giuliano really was from these men and women. I was expecting a group of fragile, quiet people doing the best they could to keep Giuliano's dream afloat. However, when the actors arrived, the tone of the room immediately changed. Standing in front of me were four vibrant, tough individuals who were not going to be intimidated by any question a journalist could ask them. I told them I wanted to do a profile on Giuliano, one that would go deeper than a recitation of the publicly known facts of his life. I said that I wanted to hear their stories about him. Uh, the response I got was an emphatic no. Batul Taleb explained the reasoning behind the troops' decision. The problem is people keep asking for the same stories, and we're not going to immediately cry for them and say, yeah, I've been beaten, Juliana was murdered, everything is so horrible, and cry and be pitiful. Uh, I was horrified on two levels. First, I had never had an interviewee completely say no. Uh, secondly, I felt ashamed that I appeared to be yet another in a long line of journalists harvesting personal stories from these people. The four actors requested that they talk about the future, not the past. I had no choice but to agree and the conversation that we had was more enlightening than what would have resulted from sticking to the questions I had arrived with. Uh, following Giuliano's death, Batul, Iyad, Moomen, and Mariam left Ju Jenin for Ramallah, the de facto capital of Palestine. There they began working on While Waiting, an adaptation that in part deals with Giuliano's murder. Um, during this time, they decided they were going to found their own theater company and came to the United States partly to raise support. One of the biggest obstacles they faced, and still face, is a constant misinterpretation of Giuliano's work. Mo Men was emphatic about clarifying what Giuliano was doing in Janine. His goal was not to establish a children's theater, which is the impression you get from newspapers here. He was creating resistance to the arts by presenting quality Palestinian theater. He said once, quote, I don't want to bring ideas from the rest of the world to help Palestinians. Just give them tools. They already have ideas. 
It's true that many of the articles that have been published since Giuliano's death refer to the Freedom Theater as a children's theater. Quote, Giuliano would cry if he saw this was how his work was described. Bowman finished. People think of us as children, but we are not children anymore, said Iyad Hurani, whose genderqueer sexualized depiction of the Mad Hatter and Alice provo provoked ire and hatred from conservative elements in Palestine. Another obstacle faced is the pressure to stay with the Freedom Theater. There's a fixation on Giuliano's past, on what he completed before he died. While some people would consider his death an end to his work, his students continue onwards. Quote, when we decided to study theater, our friends and family asked us, and after that, where are you going to work? We didn't have an answer, Moeman said. Unfortunately, according to Yad, people don't understand and they get angry at us for leaving Janine in the Freedom Theater. But the Freedom Theater graduates, well, where will they go? Right now, there's nowhere. We have to be responsible for them. Giuliano did establish an acting school in Janine, which is an admirable achievement. But after talking to Moeman and Yad, it became clear that the school was only one step towards Giuliano's goal. According to them, Giuliano called for a third intifada, but instead of guns and bombs, he wanted an uprising of, quote, poetry, music, theater, cameras, and magazines. As we talked, Batul commented that theater is, quote, always about politics, but Momen added that the troupe wants, quote, <coughs> art in Palestine like there is art in Vienna, Italy, and America. We want to spread art everywhere. Giuliano started the Freedom Theater in its acting school. Now his students are creating their own theater with hope that as more students graduate, more theaters will be created. For Giuliano, it was not enough to create one theater, one acting school. The Freedom Theater was the spark by which to ignite a cultural explosion, a diverse and modern Palestinian culture. Quote, the stage is our gun, and we have to fire specific shots. We have to tell people that they are responsible for what is happening on stage, Iyad said. What do you want us to ask you? I asked as the conversation drew to a close. How you can support us, Iyad responded instantly. How can we support you? Follow us, Moeman said simply. Follow us and tell everyone that there are Palestinians and that they want to create good art. Iyad added, we are young and we have the future. Iyad Moeman, Batul, and Mariam's new theater company is still unnamed, but they are already in the process of applying for grants and funding. By breaking away from Giuliano's theater, they are taking the next step in his cultural intifada. Meanwhile, the theater and its acting school continues in Jenin. Giuliano Mercamis is gone, but what he is created has taken on a life of its own, spreading a new kind of resistance through Palestine. In a September interview, acting general manager Jacob Gao spoke to the theater's future, quote, the Freedom Theater is stronger than whatever can be thrown at it. The Israeli army can come and take us all, but the Freedom Theater will keep going. So in 10 or 15 years, when people see the Freedom Theater is here, still fighting, people will start realizing more and more people will join us in our idea. Thank you. few brief comments and then I'm going to turn it over to questions so you could respond to me and questions from the audience since we don't um, have that much time. Um, I enjoyed all of these papers and um, the papers have a certain similarity. Uh, they're all about movements that survive under increasingly repressive conditions that draw from a toolbox of cultural and historical contexts that have some connections to previous movements. Um, and I kept thinking about Berta Taylor's argument about abeyance structures, how activists survive during periods of repression and then are able to surge again. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask the um, panelists was if they had read each other's papers, because some of your papers do speak to each other in interesting ways. And so I'm going to start with um, Jane's paper, which what I liked best about your paper <coughs> was dispelling this myth that because we have this new form of technology, that's why we have uh, successful revolts. Because the new forms of technology come with a lot of strong pitfalls as, all, as well. Um, I, was, I wasn't convinced by your explanation for the Islamic Revolution. And I was troubled a little bit at, from that by the absolute absence of the path of the left, of supporters of Mossadegh, of people who were a large part of the revolutionary com, um, contingent. They weren't listening to Khomeini. They were, they had something else in mind, um, and that there's complicated reasons why the Khomeini faction really dominated um, in the revolution. 
I'm also wondering, and this is um, leading into Laura, uh, Lara Suzanne's paper, whether the lack of ability to use the internet explains fully the failure of the movement, given that <coughs> Mubarak tried to disrupt the internet, that there's other forms of activism that occur when you can't use internet. Um, you also spoke in your paper about transnational um, actors, but I'm wondering how important transnational actors really are. I'm not convinced they were important, for instance, at all in Tunisia or Egypt. Um, <coughs> and turning over to Lara, uh, I found that really interesting about the women's movement and, and the importance of women in the Green Revolution. Um, some of these movements I had no idea about. They're quite interesting. I was puzzled by your, what you label rebel and what you label reformist, because I would have reversed the labels. I mean, the ones which you claim have um, holistic concerns about women's issues in general, a broad sense of feminist goals, you call reformists, and you call rebels those who are non-ideological, focused on pragmatic, smaller issue, er issue areas which to me is reformist. So I wonder how you came up with, with how you labeled these two different movements. Um, but I was really fascinated by the choice, very good choice, of focusing on polygamy and adultery, given that men can have many wives, but if any of those <coughs> wives cheat, he can murder them. <laughs> so it's really quite a um, condition. And I also saw that wonderful film, The Separation, which I think is a very feminist film. I read it that way. Um, okay, um, Egypt, what I loved best about your paper was the way in which the significance of art and images um, for the movement and the way in which that movement has um, tried to unify through these symbols. Um, what I'm not convinced about is I mean, I agree totally with, the, with your final conclusion about the foundational origins of Nasser and the Tahrir Square being absolutely opposite. I don't think that they're at all, even alike at any level. And I'm not convinced that they're alike because they're, they have symbols of, nation, of nation or symbols of the flag and nationalism, because frankly, all movements do. And I don't think that the Egyptians in using the flag or the nation, I mean it is a nation, were trying to s organize on the base of nationalism. I think they were trying to say to the military, you, this, is, this isn't a, a small group within the country, this is the entire nation. And I think actually that's why the military did not fire on them, because they did, it was difficult to um, square their mission with firing on the entire nation. Um, so I wonder why you made that comparison. And normally, if we do a movement of the past, and I would say in yours too, if you look at the Shah and the Green Revolution, I mean, the revolution against the Shah and the Green Revolution, why are these movements of the past, do you deal with them? Where is the connection? How does specifically, are there people that come out of that period? Are they periods of people who were active then? Are they disillusioned? I mean, it's a huge gap in time. Is there any way in which these really are connected? Because I know I've been with activists, you know, Chilean activists used to tell me that they'd been organizing since 1907 nitrate mines, but there was an ideological connection to those struggles. And so I'm wondering what, why you do these earlier movements, how they connect. Um, fascinated by the papers on Palestine, um, I, I sh you know, I, I, had two, I had two comments really about your, your paper on the, all of the difficulties and absolutely true <coughs> difficulties that, that make the Palestinian movement different and much more uh, difficult. And I was also thinking the other fragmentation, it's not just political fragmentation, it's spatial fragmentation. It's, it's no Tahrir Square, it's checkpoints. It's how do you get from this place to that place? 
But what they have done is use that as forms of mobilization. So I think there's more forms of mobilization than you're paying attention to. There's been a lot of activism around the wall, a lot of nonviolent activism in Berlin and Berlin, and um, there's also, um, oh, I had another movement I was thinking of, oh, Sheikh Jarrah. <laughs> There's been a tremendous amount of activism, and these have also brought in people from other countries and Israelis. They're fighting an uphill, uphill battle, um, but I think you shouldn't um, disregard them altogether. Um, and I, um, you know, fascinated by the paper, um, I absolutely love their response to you. <laughs> I, I think. Uh, it's really interesting, and I think this ties in with your paper on Egypt, this idea of using art as a form of resistance. Um, there has been a lot of that coming out of Palestine, and if people haven't seen Five Broken Cameras, it's coming here in June, you must see it, which is a grassroots filmmaker from Belin who has filmed his, the struggle of Belin against the wall um, and where their olive trees, they've been cut off from their olive trees, and against the settlers who've taken over that land. And the five broken cameras are the five cameras that get shot while he's doing the filming. Um, so it's a, it's a powerful story, but I think that, uh, uh, I agree, Palestinians are facing really major, major forms of difficulty in, in mobilizing. But I think this idea of using art and the ways in which people have used underground struggles um, is, is where we may hope for some forms of change. And I'd like to turn it over to the audience. Um, if you have other questions, uh, I'll take a couple questions and then you guys can answer those and then I'll take some more. Okay, um, I have a few things. First of all, I think it's awesome that you all are studying this, because I know in my department, like, nobody is studying the Middle East, and I think it's, like, really an important thing that needs to be studied. So. Um, okay, so most of my questions are for um, Jane. Um, okay, so you mentioned that, I thought your thing about that the internet is less important than we think it is, and actually the earlier forms of communicating among these movements were, were more successful. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, though, about the flexibility of the internet. That just strikes me as a really key difference. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one thing. And then I also was thinking that if this is like a key thing you're trying to say, that the internet didn't actually matter to the extent people think, it might be interesting in a future project to like to find a similar country and look at how um, both countries had these movements that are using the internet and the government had a similar reaction and in one case it was successful and in one case it wasn't. So like look, it wasn't the internet, it was something else. That might be an interesting future study. Um, and then I also was intrigued by what you said that, um, well, you said that the informal um, organizations will have mattered because the formal organizations were like, created by the government. And I have a background in Latin America where I feel like um, there's a long history of formal organizations <coughs> becoming, you know, losing their ties to the state or like having subsidiary organizations that end up being detached from the state that are really important for movements. And I was wondering, I was curious. Um, if there's any of that going on. Yeah, so the model that I used is, uh, the actual model that I used is based on a guy who was talking about Poland under communism, and the info, the, what the, the mode of association was the church. And so the communist government in Poland was not able to eliminate the church, but they also couldn't control it. So it became this weird sort of safe haven for informal association. And that's just, that's the example of that. And he's talking about how things like the church soccer leagues, um, like uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, like poetry societies, those became, in, in Iran, a notable informal mode of association, and these things called banyads, which are charitable organizations. And charitable organizations, they double as localized money lending, uh, support for crisis management, stuff like that, but they also are safe spaces where people can communicate. And they work because they're not because they're not created by the state, whereas the state can, you know, they set up the educational institutions, they set up many, you know, the state has women's groups mm -hmm. that meet to discuss issues that purportedly pertain to them. 
But it seems hard to believe that there would be like constant state 100% control. And there isn't. There yeah. isn't. There's a spectrum of it. But there's, there's such a deep distrust of formalized institutions that even if there is no infiltration or monitoring, there is some inherent distrust of a lot of institutions just because of the background of how they were created. Comparative study of success and failure of these things, that's what my research is on more broadly. Yeah. That, that's, that's, uh, the flexibility component, that's, that is an advantage of current new media. Uh, that's a huge advantage of current new media. One of the things that was the cassette tapes, why it was, and I just want to get to a point that you made earlier, but that why it was so successful is the cassette tape was perfectly suited for Khomeini, for his style of speaking, for his, his, his rhetorical flamboyance. It was, it was the exact right medium for him. It's like, you know, what's the right medium for, you know, you know any great speaker or orator? Um, and you brought a, a one thing with this uh, explanation of the revolution. I think I just went through it too quickly in my paper. I did mention that the left, secular intellectuals, feminists, the ethnic minorities that are around, the Azeris, the Armenians, they were a huge part. They, the revolution was a broad-based effort. However, using the, the cassette tapes, not only did Khomeini draw support, he also consolidated control. So by the summer of 1978, he had relegated all these other groups to a second-tier status within the revolutionary hierarchy. And then throughout, the reason I put 1980 as the end date is the summer and fall of 1980 is the great bloodbath purge of all the other elements, the communists, the, this, this, the secular intellectuals, the ethnic minorities, all of them who participated actively in a revolution, they were, they were you know, it's, it's unknown how many people were executed at that time. But I did address that they were participated and that part of this, his strategy, was also to consolidate, not just to draw support. That's a very interesting argument. You should include that in the paper. That's, that's fascinating. And I haven't seen that done. I haven't seen that argument made about how, why, that he consolidated that early. Um, uh, any other questions? Um, this question is for William. Yeah. Uh -huh. I just want to ask, you know, when I think about the Arab Spring, I'm not really asking the question why um, Palestinians aren't revolting against the PA, but why the Arab Spring didn't generate new energies to revolt against occupation, you know, in total. And, I mean, I guess, I mean, not to disregard, you know, the uh, movements against the wall of Berlin that's constantly happening, but just, you know, if you would, um, because, actually I'm asking because in 2007 was the last time I was there, and I remember the split, the fragmentation was really, you know, building up at that time. And I'm wondering if you would cite this split as reasons why it's not generating, or is Palestine in some kind of a new, maybe, situation that's very distinct from the rest of the Arab world? I think, and you know, this is me personally based, a lot of this would be based on the experiences that I had during the eight months that I was there. I think they are now. I think now Palestine is at a different point. But I, I think that the the split between Hamas and Fatah is a really important, a really important contributing factor, even to why there wasn't a renewed, you know, a renewed sense of urgency in demonstrating against the occupation. There were instances where there was. I mean, uh, last May 15th, there were huge demonstrations all across the Middle East, and you know, Palestinians from abroad that lived in the diaspora were trying to breach the borders with Israel, and things like that. But it it didn't take off in the manner that everybody seemed <coughs> to think it would. And I think I think the, I guess the common misconception was that this is Palestine that we're talking about. There's a legacy of these kinds of social movements, and now, like you said. There has to be this re-energization of everything that was happening, you know, but it didn't seem to take off. And I think, I think that the situation on the ground, and especially in the West Bank, which is where that, I, which is where I was, and where I felt that this was most obvious, was the Palestinian Authority, in my opinion, has just as much of a vested interest in keeping everyone quiet, even even demonstrating against Israel, because the level of cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and Israel is, you know, it's 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 through the roof. So there's just as much of a vested interest as far as you know, making sure that the money is flowing in, the tax revenues from the border. You know, there was a lot of emphasis by the Palestinian Authority to make sure that nobody was really demonstrating about anything. Especially, I mean, they, they stifled the demonstrations in Ramallah 
that were in solidarity with Egypt and Tunisia before they even, you know, before they even started. They were shutting down Facebook groups and everything. But I, I really think that the, the Hamas Fatah split, especially in the case of the West Bank, is what kind of stifled the opportunity to see that re-energization of everything. And I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned kind of this like spatial resistance, because this is something that's absolutely been fascinating to me. And I think this is one area where Palestinians excel to, to an incredible level. The renegotiation of space by Palestinians as like sites of resistance is incredibly fascinating. So even, you know, there's like this Palestinian saying of the concept of like samud and steadfastness and you know to exist is to re to resist and i think in the palestinian case it's it's really fascinating because you know something very simple like getting up and going to work in the morning you know you have to pass through a checkpoint to go to work whether it's a israeli checkpoint or a palestinian authority checkpoint because even though they've dismantled some of the israeli checkpoints in the west bank a lot of them have been replaced by palestinian authority checkpoints so yeah i, th I just thought it was really fascinating that you brought up spatial resistance because i think it's extremely important and, you know, spatiality and villages like Berlin and Nabi Saleh and Sheikh Jarrah, those are areas where you're constantly seeing that form of resistance, but I think that there's something that's keeping it from going to, to another level, and those are some of the things that I kind of tried to address as to why it wasn't going beyond where, where it's been sustained at for a while. Um, so question for Stephanie. Um, so I, I was lucky enough to be in, in Egypt recently, which you know, um, and I, I guess I wanted to, this is not exactly about, so I have two questions, I'll try to be brief. So some of it, one is about the, the um, notion of nationalism at one point that developed that you um, spearheaded and how it reconnected later. Um, I wondered what your thoughts were and I guess uh, what our thoughts are in general with, with the fact that in social movements, um, we often claim that it's a form of nationalism and we, and we often connect to a particular period in time and then, and then Despite that, sometimes those symbols of that of that period in time, sometimes they're displayed in art, but other times they're destroyed. So I wondered, um, and, and, and they're destroyed. And they don't. It's not, for example, where okay, you're you're opposed to Hitler, so we all destroy things that Hitler built. It appears as though sometimes you destroy things that are part of this new nationalism. So um, lots of things that Nasser was responsible for, things that he built, or even the buildings and that came about at that time um, were the buildings that were burnt, uh, where the government offices. Um, were held. I just wondered what you saw in your, your work or what you, what you thought about that. Um, and then the second, the second question, which is not, not, not exactly what you covered, but just in context of what everyone else has been discussing, what your sense of things are um, in terms of the role that social media played um, in, the, in what happened in Egypt. I, it was clear when I spoke to some folks there that they felt it was really um, an important role and that, it, and that it was sort of this transnational activist regime that helped to, to take um, hold of what happened and, and really gave people a sense that there was um, that there was a commitment around the world to what they were doing. Um, but I wonder what you what you thought about it because I, I, it wasn't clear by the time I left. Um, what was clear is people were disappointed. Um, that was sure. Um, I, the social media question is really interesting. I, I was interested in your discussion about that too. Um, and I think in Egypt it played a, a, a sort of a Manichaean role. Um, I think that certainly social in the in the beginning, I mean, especially w right after the um, <coughs> self-immolation of uh, Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia, um, social media played a huge role in disseminating that information and making sure, I mean, not making sure, people, people were using social media to become aware of what happened and to tell their friends and, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, collect their disenchantment. Um, but then when Mubarak shut off the internet, um, they say that, well, the argument has been made that um, that actually caused people to go out onto the streets <coughs> because they they couldn't go on Twitter to get their information. They needed to go on the streets to uh, and see what was going on for themselves. Um, and I'm, I'm resistant to the idea when people say that social media, you know, cause these re revolts. I mean, I know Laura has done a little bit of work on that. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a problematic statement. Uh, but I think, I certainly think that they, they contributed significantly to how they played out. Um, and not, and not necessarily in the ways that would, that you'd think of first. Um, and then in terms of your first question, um, I, actually didn't know that. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. In terms of what I saw, the places that he sort of established, um, 
And right. maybe it was because of what they represented now, because they were government offices, you just kind of have to destroy them. But, um, and particularly them being so, there wasn't an attempt to destroy old Egypt, for example, at least from what I saw. There wasn't an attempt to harm pyramids. There was not an attempt to go to the Valley of the Kings and destroy um, what has brought it. It, it was more about um, this, this modern, you know, nationalism since the 50s and 60s. Um, right, and I think that um, to a certain extent, I sort of touch on this a little bit in my presentation. Um, Nasser, w you know, was so contradictory and his legacy is contradictory. <coughs> so maybe, um, I mean, this is conjecture, but perhaps that the buildings that were burned uh, represented the paradigm that Nasser established with, you know, dictatorial rule that Sadat and Mubarak, um, exactly. Um, but I do think, and this is also is conjecture, I mean, I think that Nasser is, is viewed in Egypt as, um, as a, another point of pride, especially with um, the Free Egypt Radio. Uh, I mean, because of Nasser, Egypt, the Egyptian dialect is the most widely understood. It's kind of like the universal dialect in the, the Arab world. Um, and also because of his, I mean, he, he spearheaded the only, um, the only, well, one of the only uh, direct assaults on Israel, um, the, certainly the most major. Um, and of course, he was roundly defeated, and the coalition was roundly, soundly defeated, I guess is the expression. Um, but still, I mean, the people are still proud of, of Nasser for having uh, mobilized the anti-Israel um, effort in such a meaningful way. So yeah, I think that his, his legacy is certainly conflicted. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess I have a question connecting uh, your presentation and Olivia's presentation. I guess I'm thinking about, um, I don't know, Olivia, in your research, if you found any connection with the Arab Spring in the productions that were happening in this theater, and how, because I'm really fascinated by this idea of like cultural resistance to a cultural occupation. And I'm wondering how that speaks to the kind of gap you were looking at and the political, the, the, you know, the, the way that the Palestinian Authority functions and how we can imagine resistance in Palestine, right? So making a bridge between what you were saying and what Olivia was saying. I don't know how to deliver that question to you guys, but... Um, well, what's interesting, this, uh, when I was interviewing the students, or the graduates, rather, I don't think the Arab Spring came up, but they did talk about Occupy. A fair amount. They really, they really. I mean, because they and when they were here, they went to, to Cotty Park or Liberty Square. Um, they and they talked a lot about that. I, I can't remember offhand what they said other than that they they really liked it. Um, uh, but sorry, what was the second part? Was um, I guess I was just thinking about the kind of chronological overlap with the time it sounds like you were in Palestine as well and this concept what I was wondering if you have any comments on the concept of cultural occupation or cultural resistance as political resistance. Yeah, more no, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, just based on the time that I spent there and the research that I've done, I think the kind of the idea of like cultural and spatial resistance is an area where Palestinians excel greatly. Um, you know, every day that I was there, there was something happening that was an art exhibition, you know, an opening, a documentary, a, a panel discussion like this one, talking about culture. You know, there are cooperatives, you know, embroidery cooperatives throughout the West Bank that are making handcrafted goods, you know, despite the fact that you could buy them, you know, cheaper in China and they could be imported to Jerusalem. But they're literally, you know, sneaking goods from, sneaking handcrafted, you know, dresses and things from Hebron in the West Bank through the wall to be sold in Jerusalem. So I think that's kind of an area where, you know, there's a very vibrant and strong culture and that's something that, you know, like, a, you know, a war, you know, military occupation, economic, you know, economic strife, you, it, it can't touch it in a way. It's something that's kind of, I think it's, it's you know, the culture and the cultural, you know, the cultural heritage is, it's above the political situation. So there's everything that can be happening on the ground, but that's just something that's not going to be given up and it's not going to, you know, it, it evolves and it changes as, you know, as the, as the region evolves and changes. You know, the, there's the debate about whether, you know, what, what Ramallah is in comparison to a, a place like Nablus or Janine, you know, because Ramallah is more, it's more westernized. The buildings are modeled after buildings in Tel Aviv and people will argue about whether Ramallah is, is Ramallah really Palestine or is it becoming something else? But it's like it still has this, you know, cultural underlay that's never going anywhere and it never changes because it's still like that's what you know, that's what Palestine is and that's the essence of it. And you 
the political situation just can't can't touch it. I wouldn't say that it's. I mean quite the, the culture's above politics. I think in a way it's like apolitical in a way that ends up serving uh, Palestinian interests in politics really well. At least with cultural occupation as it was as, as I came to understand it, the idea that like if you can unshakably create that idea of a Palestinian culture, that creates the identity which 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 provides a sturdier uh, platform for the idea internationally and within Palestine as Palestine. As, as a place worthy of its own, you know, identity, politics. Yeah. So in some ways they... I guess I maybe would rephrase a little bit of what I said. I mean, I think, like, the idea of resistance in politics is also something that's in, it's embedded in culture. You know, it's very much become, I think, you know, Edward Said wrote a book called Culture of Resistance. You know, every act, I, not to put it, you know, too plainly, but, you know, pretty much everything that a Palestinian can do throughout a day is an act of resistance given the context in which they're living. And I, I remember, you know, I can't remember the, the guy's name, but it was cited in an article by a professor at NYU, and she was interviewing a Palestinian taxi driver, and he said, every morning that I get up and go to work, every morning that I shave and get out of the house and come to my job, everything that I do throughout the day is the greatest act of resistance that I could possibly do. It's greater, it's greater than me ever taking up a gun or, you know, demonstrating the fact that I'm living my life and that I keep going is is the greatest form of resistance that we could do. And I think, yeah, like you said, you know, I think the pol the political situation is it's a part of the culture and it's become the culture. Um, did you want to say something more? Yeah, I would like to respond um, to your question about how I came up with these definitions. Well, first of all, I borrowed them. I'm a scholar. How did I say he? But obviously, since I use them, I agree with her. And I, when I think, this goes back to the basic conceptualization of what we understand as a rebel and a reformist. So to me, a rebel is young and undecided <laughs> and reactive to e immediate uh, changes in the environment, whereas a reformist aims, the aims of a reformist are more focused and disciplined, as seen in aiming uh, for Iranian law reform. They may be more experienced, and thus a reformist to me has a more long-lasting um, history of activism, and I do think that these um, descriptions um, fit um, with uh, the profiling of the activists that I've conducted in my research. That's, it's really fascinating. I, I, I certainly don't see those two things that way still. I mean, if you're talking about revolutionary movements that may be older and they're focused and they topple governments and they create revolutions, those aren't reformist regimes. And just because somebody's young and doesn't have um, focused organizational goals doesn't make them a rebel. But we disagree, I, I may disagree with this generation entirely on this. Um, Do you think that um, and I, I missed your paper, unfortunately, but do you think that, um, I guess, in reference to, like, reformism, do you think it's tied to, like, do you think that maybe the rebellious nature of, like, focusing on, like, micro-organizations, not necessarily on, like, a large scale, do you think that's kind of in a response to, like, globalizing, the, the globalized nature of, like, feminism as, it's been understood, um, and I mean, am I am I being clear? It's just like I feel like because I I kind of feel that um, it is like I mean, younger people tend to be turning more towards like personal, um, like smaller like organizing bodies as opposed to trying to like reform like nationwide. I I don't know what the case is in were you studying Iran? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the case is there. Um, I've heard a lot from people who are like trying to um, get like, they kind of model like Western organizations as like their models for reform or even like revolution. Um, so I guess would you connect the problem of like Westernization, if it is a problem to you, to like why you might call them reformists? 
I'm not sure if I still really understand the question, <laughs> but I. <laughs> Um, Can I say one thing real quick yeah. in terms of, um, I mean, I don't know if this exactly connects, but if we, like the literature on global social movements mm -hmm. does point to the fact that um, not only in terms of pre-modern values and things like that that people might devolve to, but that you might see um, where people want to go back to local ways of handling things. Yeah, yeah, um, local I think is the word I was looking for. And I don't know if it's local, but, but it, it, and I'm just saying, paraphrasing your phrase, but just much more... Um, um, old school ways of handling things. Um, to, just much, you know, let's get together and talk about it in more localized Working on like work. smaller let's Working on it on a smaller setting, even if it's still within the scope of being this, um, global. And not to confuse yeah. that with transnational, which is different. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it's in the scope of being global concerns, um, that you might see that. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if that still connects to a question, but that is, mm -hmm. kind of, that is something that's probably good. I mean, it may mean that we should throw out old school terms like rebel and reformist because we're really talking about something else, really. I'm not sure you're taking a, a category. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question for William. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand um, the behavior of the Palestinian Authority, as you described it. So you said that, um, that the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority doesn't want to didn't want to have these um, people protesting in solidarity with the Arab Spring because of ties to Israel and whatever. But I'm trying to square that with going to UNESCO and wanting to get recognition. Like, it seems to me this similar incentives would be operating there, right? That, like, they, they still want to be getting funding from Israel and whatever, so. Yeah, there's, like, and, you know, this is not me necessarily criticizing the Palestinian Authority, but they're they're playing a balancing game in what they're doing. You know, they, they have to appeal to the people that they're representing, but they also have, to, you know, to make sure that they still have a functioning government, they also have to appeal to a lot of outside people. So, Based on every, you know everything that I saw while I was there, it was in the interest of the Palestinian Authority to make sure that the demonstrations in solidarity with Egypt and Tunisia weren't happening, because you know they knew that it could take it, it could go to another level, it could go to a point where they maybe couldn't, they couldn't handle the situation. They kept it at a level where they could handle it, and they didn't really let anything happen until finally when Mubarak fell, they let people go into the streets, and there were a few thousand people in Ramallah, you know, celebrating the fact that the Mubarak regime had been toppled. But like you said, you know, they, they still, you know, they went to UNESCO, and that was something, in, you know, they did this, the statehood push, which I think, you know, things like the statehood push and UNESCO, they're a way for the Palestinian Authority to kind of play to play to their constituents in a manner where they're, you know, the statehood push in particular I think is a good example of this. They went to the United Nations and regardless of whether or not, you know, a lot of the Palestinian people supported them, I honestly can't comment on whether or not, you know, I wasn't there and I don't know what they really thought, but, you know, all the Western countries, you know, the U.S. in particular said don't do this, you know, stand down, don't do this, we're, we're going to cut funding, and they did it anyway. But if, you know, if they wouldn't have done it, it would have looked, at least in my opinion, you know, to people on the ground as them backing down, you know, not standing up for, for the Palestinian right to statehood, you know, and like kind of capitulating to the demands of the West or the demands of Israel, because Israel was saying the same thing, you know, we'll cut, we'll cut your funding, we'll suspend the tax revenues that we're taking in from the border for you, you know, things like that. Did they cut some? some um, can you get... Yeah, because it's six o'clock, and um, Stephanie, did you have one? You were, spoke very little. Did you have any comments um, you wanted to make before we? I think I did. I'm all set. Everybody set. All right, you could speak informally. Thank you very much.